what we plan to do tonight is first um, to, to have a presentation. So uh, share a few of the ideas of ours. If I say of ours, I speak about David Bollier, my colleague from um, Amherst, Massachusetts in the US and, uh, and myself. We have co-authored several books uh, uh, for the last decade, basically. And, and after that, engaging into a discussion. But we might even split the presentation, in, presentation into two to allow you to express your thoughts in between. I'll invite you to do so. This is the book I'm talking about. It's called Free, Fair and Alive, The Insurgent Power of the Commons, which points to a very basic idea, which I think is important for whenever we talk about a great transition. And this basic idea is that we need to connect the three, three huge ideas, that of liberty and freedom, that of justice and fairness, and that of being alive and sustainability. Because in many debates, these are pitted against, these three ideas are pitted against each other. People say that if you have freedom, you don't have fairness, or if you stand up for ecology, you can't have economic freedom, etc., etc. So what we try to do and why we think it's, it's a very powerful concept is because the Commons allows us to combine these three very powerful ideas. So this has been one reason to um, engage. For me, it's always one, a, one, a very strong reason to engage in the Commons. But there are other reasons too. So I will share three reasons for why the Commons now with you. And the first of it is very personal. It's like I, I grew up in this little village. Um, and the border, the system border between capitalism on the one hand and socialism on the other hand has been right here where you find the white line. So I have, I grew up in this little village on the eastern side in the socialist part. And I couldn't go any further than this white line. I couldn't see what's on the other side. I saw it in the evening in the news. And in these news, because we looked at the news from, from West Germany, in these news, they portrayed a world which was so, so different from ours. And in our news on the Eastern side, they did the very same thing. They portrayed a world which was supposed to be the opposite of the world behind that, as it was called by the time, Iron Curtain. So you will easily get it if you think about there was state power in socialist countries, market power in the capitalist countries. There was collective property in the socialist countries, private property in um, the capitalist countries. And so we, we 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 were raised we we grew up with that idea that the other world is so 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 different and when in early 91 no early 91 for the first time in my life i was 23 by the time i could actually climb up that little hill and look actually at the other side i realized a very weird thing I realized that the world over there behind the Iron Curtain is pretty similar to ours. You know, the, the people living, caring for their villages, caring for their landscapes, trying to feed their families, etc., etc. So one of the reasons is that we were trained to look at the differences, to focus on separation instead of connection. And this is actually very deeply rooted in the way we create knowledge and the way we look at the world. We focus on these definitions separated from us. We focus on either or thinking as if, for instance, nature would be different, uh, would be the opposite of culture. There's teacher and pupil. 
there is men and women. There is nature and culture. There is socialism and capitalism. But if you look at it very closely, you see that, for instance, in socialism and capitalism, it's both an ism. So there is there's something they share. And we were not used to think about what we actually share. We were not used to think in terms of connections and rather focused on separation. So this is one onto epistemological reason why we need to look at the world differently if we want to recreate the world differently. And if we look at the connections between socialism and capitalism, as I said, they are both isms. They are both systems with ideology based on ideologies. In both systems, we had property-related conflicts. And in both systems, we have power over people. It's just different expressions and mechanisms of power, but it's power over people. The second reason for the commons is, I call it institutional. And you have here, you might know her, our Chancellor Angela Merkel who was speaking for about a decade now about what she calls market conform, a market conform democracy, a democracy aligned with markets. And it's actually very interesting right now in the Corona crisis in Germany. What we, what we see is that politicians need to do whatever they can to keep the economy going even though people at this very moment staying at home don't need cars, don't want to buy cars, don't need that much stuff, don't spend that much money. But it's utterly important for our democracy to survive, to generate wealth in the market in order to then or redistribute it or do something else. So indeed, what we see is a nexus, is a link between the market and the state, which is extremely close. So rather than talking about the market versus the state, in our book we, call about, we talk about the market state. And what it does if you talk about the market versus the state, women or men, you usually make other things that exist in the world invisible. Like it's very in the gender debate, it's, it's kind of it's very obvious. Like if you focus on that binary thinking about gender, men and women, you forget the many people who don't self-identify as such. If you focus on market versus the state, as the political debate is usually doing, you forget even to see the comments or something else. And my third reason for why the comments now is a very practical one. Think about the ongoing crisis, the economic crisis after the crash of the financial markets in 2009, the government's fiasco at the Copenhagen Climate Summit and, and dealing with the climate crisis as such, or to sum it all up, the, the, the many interconnected crises where both market and state fail. In the same year, 2009, Eleanor Ostrom got awarded the Nobel Prize in Economy. Eleanor Ostrom, by the time, has been the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economy. Two years ago, there was a second one. And she, this is the moment where she gets the Nobel Prize from King Carl Gustav in 2009. And this is Eleanor Ostrom. And she challenged the conventional wisdom. wisdom that common property is poorly managed and should be either regulated by central authorities, that is the state, or privatized, that is ruled through the market. One of her most influential books until now and has been translated into many languages governing the commons, it's, it's her PhD thesis and the ideas uh, in that book have been further developed until, until she died in 2012. What we also find in this quote is it's, it's something very important that 
very often people understand that commons equals common property, as you can clearly see in that quote. But commons is not the same thing as common property, nor is commons the same as just everything for everybody without any limit. It is pretty um, complex to set up a commons and to make people cooperate in such a way that these institutions they set up together actually are long lasting, become long lasting institutions. So what we need to learn about is rather than about just common property or thinking about the commons as resources, we need to learn how to set this up and how to do the commons, so to speak. Ostrom became famous for uh, focusing on how to create institutions to secure shared resources. And uh, I won't go into these eight design principles. You can find it in any literature about the commons, but for instance, in the first, in the first uh, so-called design principle, you see that there are clearly defined boundaries, both of resource and community. That is that idea that is that many people understand that many people think um, is is depicting the commons like the commons is free for all and everything for everybody's use at any purpose is a kind of misleading idea uh, and 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 we need to be we need to focus and we need to kind of unpack this and really describe what co the commons are all about and how it works. And as I said, it's not just a certain form of property like collective property and, and, and it's not just a resource because this is a very economistic way to look at the commons and say, oh, there's a certain type of resources which are not kind of private goods nor public goods, they are common goods, but it's not. Actually, you can convert almost any kind of resource of space and of knowledge into a real commons. It's not about the resources, it's about us. It's about creating living self-organized social systems that allow us to do and use things in common. And that actually challenge enclosures, enclosures. This is a very important term because enclosures, it's something that I would say goes on for 800, 900, 1000 years now. And enclosures, especially in the 17th century and 18th century, enabled capitalism and make the commons invisible and make common management of shared resources invisible. And in doing so, there was a growing lack, obviously, of commoning experiences and commons knowledge. And today we got to a point where we even lost the language that allows us to describe what common people actually do. Because what we say in our book is basically, you can't describe the commons with a capitalist vocabulary. So think about today's archaic perspective. Uh, um, value. Within a capitalist market economy, we perceive value as price and progress means growth. Despite the very fact that a growth driven economy is precisely what undermines and threatens uh, the basis of our very economy and of our living on earth. So, here again, rather than thinking of price in a very specific measure, uh, value in a very specific measure, something that we can measure, that we can attribute monetary value to it. And if we want to tr attribute monetary value to something, then we need to measure it. And if we want to measure, we need definitions, we need clear units. And this, remember, brings us back to what I said before about focusing on separation, focusing on clear-cut definitions and, and looking at the world from 
a very bad perspective. Our suggestion now in the book is, rather than, for instance, seeing value as something, as, as something stable and fixed, that you can count, see it as something dynamic and relational. And in general, learn that relationality in the dependence is our primary reality and can never be, we can never get rid of it by, for instance, putting things in the boxes. And if you bring relationality and interdependency and also the word process back into your worldview, this actually changes everything. So let me give you an example. What does it mean if you look at the world through a different lens? Because your connections, your inner life, your full vitality is part of the way you look at the world. Look at this, our way of seeing the great sandy desert in Australia. This is a map as we know it, right? And I'm used to read this kind of maps. Today's generation, I guess, is not used to read this kind of maps anymore. They are only able to read Google Maps. But, but this one is that uh, you have lines and numbers and uh, rivers. And uh, so we, we can kind of understand as moderns um, how to deal with such a map. This, however, it's the very same landscape. It's the great sandy desert on Nuagara as seen by the Aborigines. And the whole difference is that the Aborigines try to draw in their identity, their memories, their connections, their inner worlds into that same map. And for us, it's more of an artwork it would be very difficult to use this map to orient ourselves in the landscape, in the great sandy desert, because we are not used to, we have, we have not learned how to do so. Having said this, the commons needs not only new tools, it also needs a new vocabulary. Because, for instance, saying that this is a map and this is a map too, kind of leaves you like, but these are two very different things. And I have, as they say in English, very different affordances. This map, for instance, can never give you access to the living history and the stories of the Aborigines. This one can. So we might need a new word, for a type of map that also pictures our inner lives. Just as we need a new vocabulary to denominate the type of human being we look at, if we talk about the commons. For instance, in our book, we, we came up with um, ideas like the nested eye, rather than consider us homo economicos. I'll come back to this. We talk about Ubuntu rationality, we talk about co-opetition rather than pitting cooperation and competition against each other. We talk about freedom in connectedness because we, if we conceive our freedom based on the idea that I am an isolated I, we might lose the core idea that our freedom entails the freedom of others. We focus on the concept of hierarchy, which allows us to connect peer-to-peer -peer organization with flat hierarchies, etc., etc. So this is how we try to um, navigate the pluriverse of the commons in order to grow the commonsverse. And this is the kind of language we need. If rather than looking through the same window, if rather than using an old ontology, we look at that window 
open another window and start to see things that we cannot see nor name when using the old ontology, the old framework and the old language. So we would look at the window, open another one and do what we call an onto shift, like a shift in our perspective on how we look at the world as a condition to plant an onto seed, like a real seed in our societal tissue that can then expand and grow at the micro level, at the meso level, and at the macro level. And this is how the comments based on the different worldview, on the notions of relationality, interdependence, and process help us imagine new pathways for growing a new world. So far, this has been pretty abstract and pretty kind of onto epistemological. So it's, it's not how we look at the world and how we create knowledge based on this, um, this window, of a window uh, through which we look at the world. But now the question is, how can we bring this down to earth? How can we understand commoning this social process to enact the comments from this very perspective? And, Moreover, how can we actually practice it? And there I have to introduce a second very inspirational person to you. His name is Christopher Alexander. Some of you might know him. He has, still is, an architect, but has been a mathematician, has also worked as a philosopher. And Christopher Alexander brought to the world that idea of a pattern, a pattern, which is not a pattern of a wallpaper, nor a model or a recipe. It is something that describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment. And then describes the common core of the solution so that that problem can be dealt with in such a way that you can apply it millions and millions of times without ever doing the same way twice. Is that clear to you? Picture a picture, a, a situation where you do want to do something in common. What, should, what is a problem that occurs over and over and over again? Like decision taking or dealing with people who don't respect the rules or trying to set up your boundaries because the commons is not the open field, etc. So these are similar problems wherever commoning process you look at, you will have the same questions. So what Christoph Alexander basically does is he allows us to navigate and dive into a notion of solution. Like he looks at very different solutions how did people, for instance, allow worldwide light to come into their houses? How did they make sure they feel comfortable in their places? So he looks at many different solutions all over the world and then coins the core of this solution so that this can be a map, give us an orientation of how to practice commoning in a million different ways without ever repeating twice. That is, patterns gives you an orientation about how to act, uh, which is not a prescription. So what we did in our book is we tried to coin, it's called mine, we tried to mine patterns of commoning in three different spheres. One is that sphere of what we call peer governing, self-organization. How does self-organization work? How do you set up an institution? How do you take decisions? How do you deal with conflicts, et cetera, et cetera? This is very much, has been very much part of Eleanor Ostrom's work. The second is the social life. How do we relate to each other? How do we behave um, in togetherness, et cetera? And the third one is what we call provisioning, like the economic part. 
If the commons doesn't provide food, it's not good enough. If the commons doesn't provide shelter, it's not good enough. If the commons doesn't provide a sense of belonging, it's not good enough. So we need to describe the how to the enacting the commoning and these different spheres which are all connected. We call it the triad of commoning for the moment. Perhaps in the future there will be more spheres of commoning and we can add it to our triad. So if you look at whatever commons, I didn't know if you were active in, in a commons related context and you close your eyes and you wonder do we use in our context convivial tool, tools or do we depend on tools that prescribe us, for instance, what kind of software to use, what we can do with our software or not, how to connect to people, how to speak to people, etc. Do you share the risk of provisioning? Or do you allow some people to take the risk, risk and then being forced to get enough wealth and money back from the economic activities? Do you trade with price sovereignty? Or do you actually think that there is something like the market price as a given based on the so-called law of supply and demand? If you go to peer governance, do you share in your commons knowledge generously? Or do you think that commons is, uh, knowledge is appropriable and should be copyrighted? Do you really assure consent in decision making? And if so, how to? Or is it the people on top of the hierarchy who take the decisions? Do you know how to keep commons and commerce distinct? Or do you sometimes get a sense of, oh my goodness, we live in a world of modernism, liberalism and capitalism, and there is no other way to, um, to basically repeat the same problems and errors we already know of. And so it goes on in the social life of commoning, are there spaces, is there time enough to ritualize togetherness? Do you think that there is trust as a given and as a precondition for commoning? Or can we only create trust? Or do we need to trust situated knowing? How can we cultivate shared purpose and values? Or do you think that shared purpose and value needs to be at the beginning of commoning? I think it's rather abstract and therefore I'd like to end with a few examples. Because it's a lot, it's not abstract, but it's a lot of notions. And as I said, these notions root in practices, but in each practice in a different way. So you certainly know of the community supported agriculture, which like in Germany, they grow since 2011 like this. And it's quite a success story. And the practice of community supported agriculture in Germany is pretty interesting. What they do, for instance, and it, this actually changes everything. They share the risk of provisioning before production. So what does it mean that you share the risk of provisioning before production? And how do they do this? Well, they come together, say, at the beginning of the season, like in April. And the farmer says, I need this and this and this and that for producing, for feeding 200 families, for instance. And they come up with a general budget before production. And then people are asked anonymously, um, how much do you want to contribute for the next 12 years? And people make a bid 
So they put for the next uh, 12 months, sorry, for the next 12 months, they put, say, 80 euros each month. And another person who is better off gives, decides autonomously to give 120 euros per month. And another person who is worse off decides to only give 60 um, euros per month. And this, this way you come up with the general budget where at the end of the day, everybody gets the same share of the harvest, but has contributed according to what he or she can contribute. We call it they practice gentle reciprocity. There is a coupling of giving and taking, but it's not the same for each person. It's a way to take into account different needs and different possibilities. So when they do this, when they share the risk of provisioning, what does it mean at the moment of sharing the harvest? Think about it. You commit 80 euros a month. Then the weather is awesome. You get a lot of tomatoes and cucumbers and vegetables, etc. And what is the price of each cucumber? Next, next year, the weather is awful. There are almost no, there are almost no cucumbers and tomatoes. Still, you get the same share as everybody. What is the price of that cucumber? The answer is, there's no such thing as a price. The vegetable produced in community supported agriculture lose their price. It is an economy basically where there is still money, but there is no such thing as a price defined by the market. Which basically means that only those who can afford that price can pay it and the others will be excluded. So these people, common people, what they do is they create an economy without price, which is something that economists can't even think of. And this is their way, as I said, to practice gentle reciprocity. What does that mean? It means that throughout history, human history, we see that there is a certain link between giving and taking. We also see that sometimes that there is unconditional giving. Of course there is. But unconditional giving is not something that really enacts a long enduring common. Usually there is a link between giving and taking. But this link is not fixed. It's not, it's not like you can only get your bread if you pay two euro fifty. You can also get your bread if you only pay one euro because this is what, what you can come up with. Through practicing gentle reciprocity, you allow for more inclusion. I'd like to stop it here for the moment. First of all, because I see messages coming in without being able to read it. Second, because it has been already a lot and there are more examples to come. But, uh, and third, because I think that uh, it's a good, good point to stop because we have gone through that. The common starts with another way of looking at the world. It starts with conceiving it as being, beings in connectedness, interconnected beings and dependent beings from others and from nature. It creates a new vocabulary that allows us to describe practices which remain utterly unseen in the framework of modernism, liberalism, and capitalism. And the way to describe these practices to make them more visible is a methodology we took from Christopher Alexander. The way is coining patterns and using these patterns, giving them a name like practice and gentle reciprocity and using them as a guideline, as a map, as an orientation to hopefully inspire other commoners to emulate um, successful commoning stories. The interesting thing about patterns is, is as well that you cannot only think about one. Of course, it makes sense to um, up, share the risk of provisioning. But once you do that, 
there is a, a whole sequence of conditions you change for, for your action. So if you do that, the conditions for practicing gentle reciprocity are way better. Or the conditions for creating really a different economy are way better. But also the need to sit down, organize your meeting, and agree, make common decisions about how you want to share the risk of provisioning. What I'm saying here is that one pattern is connected to the next, and this again is connected to the next, and this again is connected to the next, and this way you navigate the world of the commons. And wherever you start, you'll find that you can make one twist, one change in your practice, and this will enact and demand and require another change. So it's a way to change systematically your practice and in the different spheres, in the spheres of social life, in the sphere of organization and setting up institution and in the economic sphere. Let me give you another example. This is from chapter, chapter eight of our book, where we try to think about that question of property. You remember at the very beginning when I said um, it's, 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 it's very common to equal commons with common property, where in fact there are different ways of very many, 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 many different forms of common property. And some of them do something that we call relationalized property. That is, whenever you enact property, uh, legally, you create peoples who will be the owners, those who have. And whenever you do that, at the moment of creating owners, at the same moment you create a non-owner. So again, you enact a relation between an owner and the non-owners, or the owners and the non-owners. So we were thinking about how can we come up with forms of property that reflect on this relationality of property and take into account that whatever property I generate has an effect on nature, on future generations, on the non-owners, on the others, and even to myself. So the way I own changes myself. The way I myself enact and use property does something with me. And we found a very stunning example in the case of the Park Slope Food Corp, which is, which is also stunning because it's literally three miles away from Wall Street, uh, New York. So the Park Slope Food Corp is existing for almost 50 years now. And if you go there, you, go, you, you enter this place you can see in the slide and you go there and inside you will find a huge, 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 huge supermarket. And it looks like a huge, 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 huge supermarket. Lots of stuff, plenty of people shopping, people on the cashiers, etc. And then you go to the cashier and you ask, oh, so, um, and who are you? Well, I'm Mary. Okay, and what are you doing? Oh, I'm a psychologist. Great. You go to the next cashier and say, oh, are you, who are you? So I'm Tim. And what are you doing? So I'm a car taxi driver. And the thing is that these people, the taxi drivers and the psychologists and the lawyers and whomever, they themselves themselves run the supermarket. And they, as opposed to other um, property models where you have cooperatives, you usually have a share. You buy your share in the cooperative and independent from if it's one share, two share, three shares, or many shares, you have one vote, which is certainly more democratic than the property models we usually have in the capitalist economy. But still, you, you can kind of buy into a cooperative, so to speak. This is not the case in this Park Slope Food Cooperative. 
This cooperative says, okay, you can have a share, you can get a share. This makes you owner, co-owner. But what we want are real members of our cooperative. So they came up with a property regime, which is called member ownership. So you, we already know how to become an owner. You buy your share, but how do you become a member? And that's very interesting. You become a member by working two hours, 43 minutes each month within the cooperative. So it's mandatory, two hours, 43 minutes, each member per month works within the cooperative to feel, feel it, to, 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 to deal with the real life problems, not to leave it to the cooperativistas. And imagine a cooperative of 70,000 members, where all the 70,000 members work two hours, 43 minutes, cleaning, caring for the children while others are shopping, being at the cashier, um, packing the cheese, uh, cutting the, the meat and whatever is being sold there. And this is how we can get rid of the enormous overhead costs and how you lower the price for organic regional food in midst of New York City to make good food affordable to everybody. So that idea of honoring care and decommodifying work while relationalizing property has been very inspirational for us. And again, it's something that allows you to think about, can we get rid of that, these old distinctions? Can we overcome the either or fight, less individual property, more common property? Because common property as such still doesn't solve the problem of how do I actually connect to the cooperative while working two hours 43 minutes within Park Slope Food Corp each month actually connects me with the dirt on the floor of the supermarket, with the children of my neighbor who I need to care for while their mom or dad are going shopping. So this is what we call relationalized property. And what I'm trying to introduce here with you is in a way that Imagine we would think like commoners. So we would use these patterns doing the same thing we have always done. And the answer is we would then, if we would think like commoners and using commoning patterns, we would do things differently. For instance, we would design very different houses, similar to the way the Wikipedia is being produced. We would think about open source houses who are do it together friendly, like, but from straw and clay, like these people do in an amazing project in, in Austria, where they built based on straw and clay, modern up to six story houses, which hasn't been done before in an open source, modular, do it together friendly way, combining traditional artisanship and digital production. And, and what you see here in the picture is the way of doing this, of thinking about building in a commoning way, you change the construction site completely. So this is here a few pictures from the construction site. And this is the first prototype. Uh, again, the first prototype in winter now, oh, I, 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 don't have a new picture, but now they have a three-story building already constructed in midst of uh, Vienna. And, and the interesting part here is, well, if you can see building houses that way, you don't want to sell a product. So you don't build a commodity that you sell in a real estate catalog, but you build something that can adapt according to people's needs. And you do, can do it the other way around because it's modular modern houses. 
can then actually deconstruct the different stories. So such architects think in different patterns. They share their knowledge generously. That is, they put licenses on the construction plans that allow people and other firms to do the same, adapted to local needs all over the world. They design houses in such a way that making them and using them together will become more easy. It's never easy, but they create better conditions for it to become more easy. And this is, I guess I will finish with that idea. And this is what, whenever these people tell me, share with me the, their insights about their projects, what they've learned while developing this project, I'll give you the name later in the chat, is that it actually changes everything. If you think like a commoner, if you apply patterns of commoning, it's not only that you go from one field of action to another field of action and stepwise you change the way you set up institutions, you do economy, you produce things, you relate to others. While doing that, you also transform yourself. So the invitation is to become a commoner and inviting you to kind of navigate that world, that wisdom, which is intercultural wisdom. And it has been there, let me finish with that idea, before capitalism, during capitalism, and it will be, will be there after capitalism. So be part of that. Thank you.